Uh, good morning, good afternoon, as the case might be. Um, uh, welcome to uh, this edition of the webinar series, uh, which is now called Applied Analytics Success Stories. Um, I'm Rajesh Tyagi, I'm the organizer for these webinars. And uh, these webinars are an initiative of the INFORMS practice session. And before we go to the speaker, let me just spend a minute or so on the practice session itself. I hope you guys can see my screen, right? Okay. All right, here's the, here's some information on the practice session. So the objective of this section is uh, to advance the practice of analytics, operations, research, and management sciences. And it sponsors a number of activities. So you have the three big competitions, the Franz Edelman Award, the Daniel Wagner Prize, and the George Smith uh, competition. These are the annual competitions. We also have monthly activities. Uh, we have this particular series, which is called the Applied Analytics Success Stories. Um, and the upcoming schedule is listed on the website. And the next one is on April uh, 15th. We are also starting a new uh, series called Sustaining Outstanding Analytics Organizations. And the objective there is that we will have uh, analytics managers uh, come and talk about their organization, what kind of projects they get, how are their teams set up, what are the skill sets they are looking for. So this should be very uh, helpful or interesting to especially the graduate students. We also have the networking happy hour event, which is a little bit more relaxed setting. The topic varies from um, month to month, and it is list really listed on the website what the topic for that month would be. And the next event uh, will be on March 26th, basically, which is next Friday at 5 p.m. So again, uh, we hope you will, you will uh, continue to join these webinars, and, and uh, if you find them useful, please consider becoming member of the uh, practice section. And now let me go on to the uh, speaker today. So we have the title for today's pre presentation um, is Model Serving and ML Ops. Um, our speaker is Dr. Diego Clavian, uh, who's a professor at Northwestern University in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences. He's also director of the Center for Deep Learning. His research is focused on machine learning, deep learning, and analytics with concentration in finance, insurance, sports, and bioinformatics. Professor Klavian has led projects with large companies such as Intel, Baxter, Allstate, Anthem, and many others. Uh, we will have a Q&A session after his pre presentation, and um, you can see a Q&A button on your screen. And if you have any questions during the presentation, and again, you can, or I, I should say, you can ask the presentation, um, you can submit the question during the presentation, just click on that button, enter the question, and we will continue, we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, also another note that you typically have another half an hour uh, session after this uh, webinar, and typically a lot of the questions, if there's any overflow, they continue on to the, uh, that particular um, half an hour uh, slot as well. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Professor Klavian. Professor? Yeah, thank you. All right, so let me, this will stop. Okay, let me share the screen. All right, so you should be able to see my screen. Um, all right, so thanks for inviting me. So it's really a pleasure even giving a talk at Informs. I have to admit so that I was uh, uh, heavily involved with Informs and uh, with the Informs, but uh, in the last two years, the life has just become too hectic. Um, so uh, you already learned that I'm a professor at uh, Northwest University in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences. Uh, and that I'm the director of the Center for Deep Learning, uh, and I'm also the director, actually founding director uh, of the Master of Science in Analytics, but I'm not. So today's discussion is going to be mostly around my work related to, uh, to the center, right? So, and around ML, uh, ML Ops, which is something that I actually picked up only uh, in the last two, three years, 
uh, but you can you can also argue that in general, so MLOps is a is a fairly new term uh, that's that's sort of uh, around uh, only for for a year or two. All right, so um, I'm not assuming that you have any prior knowledge of ML ops, uh, and uh, and here is sort of a, a very high level bird's eyes view of what it really is ML ops. Okay, so I'm I'm sure that the vast majority of you, if not all of you, are familiar with training, right? So in a typical machine learning uh, setting, sort of you uh, spend a lot of time with training. And actually, uh, a typical data scientist actually uh, involves, uh, or, or his or her time is mostly involved with uh, training models, right? So, but uh, I wonder if you have ever asked yourself, okay, so once I, once you quote, say, train your model, and uh, you do validation assessments and you like the performance of the model, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder if you, how many times did you ask yourself what's gonna happen next with, uh, with my model, right? So, or models for that matter, right? So, and uh, if, uh, if you have been able to show enough business value for a model, then the model will transition into so-called mo model serving phase, which is a big component or the biggest component within the uh, ML ops uh, cycle, right? So model serving essentially is taking your trained model and, uh, and putting in production or operations, whatever term uh, you want to use, all right? So, or in the machine learning uh, uh, terminology, sort of that essentially means uh, employing uh, or conducting inference on the actual model, right? So scoring, scoring the model. All right, so uh, this icon to the right here is supposed to is re represents a user, right? So user uh, puts requests or quotes, say, uh, technically speaking, feature vectors to your model. And then in model serving, your model then takes those feature vectors and, uh, and makes predictions. All right, so that essentially is uh, model serving, right? So very simple to describe, but life is uh, far from this simple. Right. So uh, first of all, there's a uh, there's a saying in industry that the best data scientists are actually used in model serving. All right. So um, and if you ask me five years ago, it, sort of, if I have just hired uh, a new data scientist and uh, uh, and he or she is an excellent data scientist, uh, what what kind of a uh, task would I uh, put him or her on? I would definitely put him sort of uh, or her something related to training, right? So, but uh, as you get more experience with model serving, you actually realize that model serving is actually harder, right? So, and and this is not, so the, the, the first bullet point here, it's not my observation. So this is what I heard from others in industry as well, right? So, so model serving is, uh, is challenging and even more challenging than the actual uh, training, right? So, and why is that the case? Well, so put it in, uh, putting it succinctly, sort of, you name it, it will go wrong, all right? So anything that you uh, predict or envision uh, for, uh, during the model serving phase, uh, it will not happen, all right? So it will not happen the way you envision it should happen, all right? So uh, let's start with data distribution. Uh, data distribution, all right? So you train your model based on certain uh, historical data distribution, and now you put your model in production, and sooner or later, the data distribution will change, all right? And I'm not, I'm not using the term, uh, the word here would change, but I, I can use, or I am using the term will change, okay? Because it does always, uh, always change, all right? So, uh, so you were, uh, for example, uh, uh, your historical data uh, was all based on, uh, for example, brick and mortar sales, right? So, and now you roll out your model, and after a month or so, you figure out, oh, okay, but most of the sales are actually happening, most of the new sales are actually ha happening uh, as part of the e-commerce channel, right? So, and, and you clearly get the, uh, get the analogy here, right? So why I picked from, from brick and mortar to, to e-commerce, right? So, and, and, uh, and that clearly means that the entire data distribution will change. And now the model now uh, has never seen such, uh, feature vectors and it will uh, start struggling, all right? So that's one, for example, it will go wrong, all right? So then quality of, of data uh, could deteriorate, right? So you have, say, you're collecting data 
uh, from or your features are coming from sensors, for example, or for any kind of equipment, and equipment can go down, right? So which means that the feature quality will deteriorate, right? So you train your data with historical um, with historical values from sensors, but then when you in the model serving phase, uh, that uh, uh, additional sensors uh, or or engine failures happen. And, and data quality can easily deteriorate, right? Then KPIs can be reassessed, right? So business priorities shift, business environment uh, can, uh, can shift, right? So uh, back to my retail example, so business priorities. So uh, once you start observing more e-commerce sales, uh, well, clearly the managers will, will start to put more, more business value to certain uh, to certain items, right? So if your model, for example, I know is trying to say some some KPI in your model relates to impulse buying, all right? So and and that implies that your model sort of will I don't know predict say how many customers will grab milk uh, and and conduct uh, uh, impulse purchases. Now in the e-commerce setting, clearly that met metrics now does not make a lot of sense, right? So, and your model then will try to struggle because the manager will see, I mean, okay, impulse buying sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of them uh, from historical data, but not from new data, right? Then, then another aspect is new features are introduced, right? So uh, new engines are, or uh, new equipment is brought, new sensors are installed. So that all means that you now all of a sudden have new features and your trained model has never seen those new features. Well, this is just some of the some of the aspects that happen during model serving, right? So by no means I'm list listening here, listing here uh, all of them, right? So what exactly is sort of if, we, if we, what exactly is part of model serving? Let's uh, drill down a little bit, right? So and first uh, I'm listing some. Uh, some aspects that are that are coming from software engineering perspective. So, uh, typical part of model serving these days is CI/CD, right? So, continuous uh, improvements, continuous uh, delivery, and uh, and deployments, right? So, which means essentially, in as part of model serving and and ML ops, sort of you want to integrate uh, all of the software engineering uh, cycles. Uh, well, it's not just integrating; you want to execute them and repeat them on and repeat them on a frequent uh, basis all right now some aspects that are peculiar to machine learning when it comes to software development uh, model versioning right so it's not just code versioning but you want also want to have uh, versions of your model and definitely a very unique aspect of software engineering is data versioning right so you ideally you want to have versions uh, <coughs> versions of your data so that you can then troubleshoot sort of why uh, why the model was uh, performing very well on data from a month ago, but it's struggling on the current data, for example. All right, so you want to go back and revert to the data from a, from a month ago. You need to model, you need to monitor, sorry, you need to uh, monitor your uh, model. And the last uh, aspect is features, uh, feature store, uh, which is sort of, I'm gonna, towards the end, sort of, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on, uh, on the aspects of the feature stores. Uh, but let me just say that uh, that a lot of uh, uh, VC thought leaders and and just VC invent investors actually I should say VC invent uh, investors are saying that 2021 is the year of the feature stores. All right. So uh, in case you're not familiar with what's a feature store, well, you can infer from the name, but I'll say a little bit more towards uh, the end. All right. So. But, uh, but from training, right? So you train your model and then you deploy it in model serving. So then it starts uh, serving requests, right? So, but uh, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, which is everything will go wrong, right? So it's not just a one-way street because when things start going wrong, you need to retrain your model, right? So there's a cycle between training and model serving. And, uh, and, and as part of this cycle, what you want to do is uh, you want to detect uh, drift, right? So whenever there's change in data or labels, you want to automatically detect that. You need to then to retrain your model. And uh, when it comes to new features potentially being introduced, you need to also uh, uh, reconfigure your model architecture, 
right? So I'm gonna talk about these uh, these three aspects. So I'm gonna spend uh, I don't know, a few minutes minutes on each one of them. All right. So and then there is feature store that uh, that sort of uh, essentially is a, is a data. Uh, duct tape, say, between training and model serving, right? So, and again, I'm going to say a little bit more about feature stores towards the end. All right, so this is also this, this the software aspects as well as the machine learning aspects are all part of uh, so-called ML ops, right? So I, I assume sort of you are familiar with the term DevOps. That's where ML ops comes from and CICD actually comes from, uh, from DevOps, all right? But now they're sort of now it's kind of you name it ops, right? So there's cyber uh, ops. Uh, there's even marketing ops. They're not calling it marketing. I forgot what they're calling it. Okay, but uh, you can pretty much sort of pick a lot of disciplines and and attach a, attach a suffix a suffix of uh, ops uh, to it. All right. So now uh, let's think about okay. So when it comes to drift uh, uh, model retraining and and potential. Uh, architecture re reconfiguration. Let's think uh, if there is actually a difference between uh, deep learning and traditional machine learning. Right. So, on this part, in this particular table, and this is this is a table that sort of I came up with uh, with it. Uh, so, uh, in the AI column, uh, think about AI as being deep learning. All right. So I'm calling it here AI and machine learning. Think about it as traditional machine learning. All right. So structure, or if you prefer a different dichotomy. Uh, machine learning, think about uh, machine learning on structural data and AI as machine learning on uh, unstructural data, All right? So uh, can one take a model serving solution developed say five years ago and simply apply it or use it uh, in with today's uh, use cases, use cases and applications that involve images, text uh, and other time series, et cetera, and other other, uh, let's say, oddball uh, uh, data sources, right? So, and the answer is the answer is no, right? So, and here is here are a few reasons as to why is that the case, right? So, first, if you think about data quality, right? So, in a sense, uh, 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 quantifying data quality, detecting that there is a change in data quality and that uh, data imputation techniques say uh, have to be changed, uh, adjusted, right? So. Uh, in traditional machine learning, in structural data, you can use your raw data, right? So to perform data quality. So you can count, for example, number of NANDs uh, in your feature vectors. And if that's uh, uh, all of a sudden sort of starts rising, okay, there's a flag, right? Uh, but that doesn't work for deep learning, right? So in other words, this does not work with images, text, et cetera, right? So you really have to do this uh, assessment of data quality on uh, on representations or embeddings, right? So what I call here representations, uh, that's a synonym uh, for uh, for embeddings, right? So same for descriptive statistics, right? So mean, standard deviations, uh, higher moments, etc., uh, uh, modules. Uh, so uh, on uh, on raw data, you can do that and make sense in structural world, but not in the unstructural world, right? So and then likewise. Uh, concept drift, right? So distribution on 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 data. So uh, you can do it on raw data, but uh, you need to do it on embeddings in the deep learning world, and uh, you can uh, apply or you should actually apply uh, auto encoders, for example, right? So retraining, um, if your model is a logistic regression model or regression or random forest, sort of retraining is usually going to be fast, not so much for deep learning, right? So for deep learning. Uh, uh, Retraining can easily be a step that takes uh, two, three days of, of uh, heavy use of GPU units, right? So then uh, confidence. So with traditional models, sort of their statistical expressions for confidence, when you step into the deep learning AI world, it's unclear what, how to measure the actual confidence, right? So and then uh, new features. Well, so if you have regression, you just add new predictors and end of the story. But uh, if you have them in a deep learning model, you need to do uh, uh, you need to uh, re-architect your uh, your model, right? So which is which is much more challenging, All right? So I'm gonna talk next about uh, about a software or solution for model serving, focusing on on deep learning models that we are developing as part of a center for uh, for deep learning and and uh, certain models or 
many modules have already been uh, actually developed, right? So this is, uh, so it's part of the center. The center has uh, membing, uh, member companies uh, and uh, we receive uh, feedback from member companies. So the architecture and, and the features that I'm about to discuss sort of they were also based on the feedback that we received, uh, we received in last year or so from member, uh, from member companies, right? So, and, and, uh, uh, and we are uh, working closely with member companies on some uh, potential use cases to, uh, to apply them to our uh, DDoS system, right? So, so what does this picture uh, depicts here or flow diagram is, so you have your training data here. I don't know whether you can see my mouse pointer, but uh, all right, so you have your training data on the left, right? So, and you have your data in inference on the top, right? So, and data in inference, so, uh, okay. So data in inference, then uh, you first need to do uh, feature engineering, or right? so data re-engineering. So I'm not calling it engineering, feature engineering, because that's usually a term associated with training, right? So uh, re-engineering, then you do inference, right? So you do scoring, and then you have to monitor uh, the performance of your model, right? So, and if you see some issues uh, with the performance, then you need to retrain your model, right? So that's at the bottom of the flow chart, you retrain your model, so uh, model retraining, and that then replaces or uh, installs, say, deploys a new version of your model into the inference engine, right? So and then what you see here, the, the vertical, uh, the vertical uh, pipeline on the left, all right? So this is, so suppose you add new data sources or new features and you need to uh, uh, re-architect your model, then we are calling this dynamic auto ML, right? So auto ML is a term where in training you are, uh, you are finding, uh, uh, you're trying to find a good model architecture, right? So here we are calling it dynamic because you need to do it uh, on the fly, All right? So this is our, this is our architecture. So let me, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, let me focus on some of the components. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more on the, uh, so let's say IT uh, software aspects of uh, of the system. All right. So so these are the the four components that I'm going to be talking about next. All right. So first is concept drift detection, and this is again all based on uh, based on uh, deep learning. Right. So we are not making assumptions that data is structured. So the data can be unstructured. The data can be a mixture of uh, images, uh, text. Uh, uh, structural data, you name it, right? So this has been done by Yiming Su. Uh, so he recently graduated, uh, what was it, two months ago, and he's now a full-time employee at, uh, at Facebook, right? So, uh, so this is the, the drift detection and, and retraining as part of the big uh, system picture. And uh, so the, the goal here is to detect whenever there's a change in the data distribution, right? So data or label distribution for that matter, right? So, and, and not clearly you can do this on a per feature basis and that becomes uh, kind of a single variate problem, but uh, features interact. And so that's why doing it on a per feature basis, it's, uh, it's far from being uh, uh, effective, right? So you wanna do it sort of at a, you want to take into account all of the features and not features uh, one by, one, right? Uh, so we want to, so the goal is, so, so the goal is actually twofold here. Number one is you want to uh, decide uh, when there is a drift, right? So, in, and in that case, you want to trigger model retraining, but at the same time, you also want to provide, uh, provide uh, some kind of hint as to what data should be used for model retraining, all right? So because, um, if you use just quote all of the data, right? So then you'll be using some stale data, right? So you'll be using data that's, that was part of a different, uh, different business environment, right? So different environment, and it's going to adversely impact your current training, right? So on the other spectrum is, well, let me just use very recent data. Well, if you do that, then you're gonna have the so-called uh, catastrophic, the issue of so-called catastrophic forgetting, right? So essentially means that your model uh, is going to forget what it learned uh, 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 more, more past in the future, uh, in the history, sorry, more, 
more back, sorry, more back into uh, in the history, right? So there's a fine line between how far you want to go back uh, in your data, All right? So uh, so what data to use for retraining? It's far from an obvious uh, question, right? So and I already said that we want to use uh, we are using structured and structured data. So let me at the high level uh, uh, explain. Uh, the concepts behind our drip detection module. So we actually have six modules, all right? So each one uh, uh, assesses uh, whether there's a drift or not, all right? So whether the drift has just happened or not. And then we do ensemble uh, based on the six called drift predictions, all right? So that's the, that's the key idea, all right? So in the six, uh, just at a high level, so I'm not gonna go into details, the six, oops. so the six, um, uh, uh, modules are uh, based on uh, classification error rate, model output uncertainty, right? So, and max probability actually is not a good measure for model uncertainty, and we don't do max probability, right? So here I'm listing max probability just as a, as a naive way that doesn't quite work well, right? So then we have one more, uh, we have an additional module uh, that looks at an order encoder, and whatever reconstruction error starts uh, uh, getting bigger and bigger, well, that's a clear hint, clear hint that uh, that there is something uh, that there are changes with the data, right? Then we use so-called Hellinger different uh, divergence, sorry, uh, which is just a metric uh, or a distance between two measures. So I'm not going to go into details. Then we use uh, some product networks, which essentially. Uh, is a way to fit a probabilistic generative model on your data, right? So, and, and if your previous model uh, fits your current data, your, your most recent data well, that means that you don't have a drift, right? So, but if it doesn't fit it well, well, that means that you're likely to have a drift, right? So then lastly, the sixth module is we, uh, we employ, uh, we look at the gradients uh, as well. Right, so I'm not going to go into details of any one of those of these modules. So one one other aspect that we learned actually from uh, from our member companies that uh, that would be very beneficial to capture is um, so most of the prior scholarly work they assume okay so you uh, you score a feature vector which and then you get a label right away, all right? So immediately after you score it, so you get a label. Well, that's, that's a scholarly assumption because in practice, that's absolutely not true, right? So if you just think about say, I don't know, let's make, uh, okay, let's say, let's say that you have a prediction for, uh, for a particular treatment of a patient in healthcare, right? So you make that prediction, well, but whether that treatment was the right one or not, effective or not effective, you're not gonna learn it uh, right there on the spot, right? So it might take a month, even, even a year, or even a few years before you learn whether you made a correct prediction or not. Well, I shouldn't say you, but the model made a uh, correct uh, the, uh, decision or not. All right, so we, we introduced the notion of lag of labels, which means you are uh, scoring uh, 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 a sample now, but the ground truth of that sample can be or is going to become available only later in the future. All right, so and, and now sort of uh, speaking about inform sort of uh, we apply. Uh, so we have in our computational study sort of, uh, we take uh, uh, constant lag, but we also vary it based on some stochastic process and uh, sort of Poisson and exponential here, it's a good choice or a natural choice, I should say. All right, so the, the schematics of the model is, so you have this, batches that are coming in that you're trying to score, all right? So, and, and, and a batch here can as well be just one single sample, all right? So, but it can, it can be, for example, that you want to score at once 10,000 batches, or, uh, sorry, 10,000 samples, all right? So that will be uh, simply one batch, all right? So for each, for each batch, we compute the six metrics that I have uh, mentioned uh, two slides back, all right? So, and, and each one of them then uh, creates a time series and then based on that time series, right? So based on that time series, we then, uh, uh, each one of the modules then makes a prediction whether uh, whether the last batch is called a drift batch or not. And then those those six predictions are then uh, taken into account uh, in, an, in the final assemble model to come up with the final uh, prediction, right? So whether there is a drift or not, right? So and along the way, 
we also have the notion of, I'm not gonna go in details about this, the notion of so-called warm zones, all right? So, and all the data, all the samples data that's inside that warm zone, that's the data that should be used for retraining. All right, so that's the so retraining batches. So batch here, W through M, for example, those are the batches that are in the warm zone and, uh, and uh, 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 software recommends them to use them in training. All right, so here are some of the uh, experiments on a variety of, of different data sets. Uh, so the, uh, the first bar is our bar. Uh, well, number one, because it's the highest one. <laughs> uh, so, which means that uh, the y-axis here is uh, accuracy. Right? So, but, but we we have other performance uh, measures as well, not just uh, accuracy, right? So this is accuracy now in, in inference, right? So in during the model serving uh, phase, right? So the other four algorithms are, uh, are benchmark algorithms that have been uh, developed before Right, so, and uh, we have different uh, uh, simulation settings to uh, come up with uh, with drifts. All right, so I'm not gonna go into details sort of what, what, is, what you can infer from the name. Okay, so sudden means all of a sudden there's a spike uh, uh, or there's a sudden change in the data. Uh, sudden and gradual means sudden change and then, uh, then the change keeps going, but gradually. Um, and then you have only, uh, then you have three different settings for just gradual change. All right, so you see, okay, so you see here, this is kind of a typical, say, scholarly <laughs> type slide. In a sense, uh, our model sort of uh, performs much better than, uh, than the other models, All right? So, but this is just, uh, as I said, uh, this is just one metric. So we actually, I think we have five different metrics uh, and, and we do well or better in, uh, in the vast majority. All right, so next, let me just quickly uh, flush out some ideas re, uh, uh, behind how do you retrain your neural, your neural network, All right? So this, this has been done uh, uh, by Chafon uh, Zhu, so she's a PhD, uh, or she received, sorry, she received PhD, a PhD in computer science, and she's now, what, for four months or so, she's working full-time at uh, Microsoft. All right, so this is the model retraining uh, module. Right, so um, so the so so the, so this is the first two bullet points is something that I mentioned earlier, which is you don't want to go too back uh, uh, in in the future, uh, but on the other hand, if you take only the most recent uh, samples, you're going to get into the issue of catastrophic forgetting. All right, so so this so her uh, so Shafong's work was uh, uh, or had two parts. So one is uh, once your drift detection module detects uh, the warm zone, right? So you still want to select potentially just a subset of uh, of samples from each individual uh, batch, right? So and and uh, so one part of the of the retraining uh, module here is uh, how do you further refine the samples that you want to use, and then the second one is how do you efficiently retrain uh, your model. Right, so and I'm not going to go into detail. So the key idea and novelty of uh, of this software module is that we employ the multi-arm bandit problem. Right, so to select samples as well as then to efficiently optimize uh, the underlying uh, deep neural network. Right, so and uh, so to select samples, essentially, when you optimize, we capture. The, when you select a, a mini batch, right? So a small subset of your data, um, we capture how much did uh, how much did the loss uh, decrease, right? So and that becomes then quote reward in the multi-arm bandit uh, setting, right? So and then the, and then so the arms correspond to mini batches, right? So the multi-arm bandit algorithm then uh, essentially selects one of the mini batches that you want to optimize over. Uh, over it next, right? So, and then the mini batch that you, uh, that was used most frequently, uh, then that's the mini batch you wanna use uh, next time when you retrain, right? So this is high level idea, right? And uh, for efficient optimization, so we actually, we cluster weights and then we optimize over, uh, over only uh, clusters of weights. So one cluster at a time, right? So, and, and we use multi-unbanded ideas again. The chart on the right here 
shows uh, in retraining, right? So in, in retraining optimization, what percentage of weights are actually being changed, right? So if you if you imply standard uh, optimization, uh, that percentage would always be 100, right? So it would uh, always touch or adjust, uh, recompute, say every single weight. But uh, in our algorithm, you see here that uh, somewhere in between 10 and 15% of the weights are only being touched, right? So which means that it's much more computationally efficient. And that's, uh, we can see here as well. Um, all right, so let's, okay, so this, this is some accuracy performance, all right? So uh, we can forget about that, okay? So if you look at the bar chart here, right? So you see that, uh, that the computational time of our algorithm, which is the one to the MAB one, all right? So MAB stands for multi unbended is actually uh, is actually very low, right? So it's not the lowest one, uh, and actually uh, MA no mess is not our seat. Okay, it's not the lowest one, but when you compare to uh, accuracy uh, performance on the left sort of, you see that uh, that we outperform the other two that have low computational time, but we are very competitive when it comes to computational time. Uh, all right, so let me skip this. All right, so uh, next a few words about incremental neural architecture search. And this is, pa this is part of the module well here, right? So uh, where uh, potentially you introduce new features, all right? So this is again an aspect that you, uh, I don't think has been studied uh, before by academicians, right? So this was an aspect that has been brought by one of our member companies, members of the center companies, right? So because a company sort of um, is actually getting new features uh, with time, right? So they, they have the issue of, of uh, deploying. So they deploy a model, right? So then they get new features and it's unclear how do you accommodate those new features, right? And this, so this module here has been driven by, uh, by that aspect. All right, so here's the, here's the formal or quasi formal setting, right? So you have uh, time is vertical, right? So which means that your old data or I guess recent data, right, has only blue blue features, all right. So, but now your new data comes up with additional features, right. So these additional features are not present earlier in time, right. So the question is, the question now is what to do, all right. So, um, so we employ ideas from neural architecture uh, search, all right. So, um, so neural architecture search is essentially uh, an application of or, or let me give credit to others. So it's a clever, uh, more credit. It's a clever application of reinforcement learning to search for, uh, for an efficient architecture, right? So we borrow the concepts from neural uh, architectural search and, and the basic idea, it's very simple, right? So if you're quote old data, which is this blue data, right? So your old data, suppose it, Suppose the network there has been uh, already trained by neural architecture search, which means by a reinforcement learning algorithm. So then that, that reinforcement learning algorithm produces a set of weights. And when you get your new features, you simply want to start, warm start your reinforcement learning algorithm from the weights of your old, uh, or based on your old data, right? So if I go back here, right? So, the reinforcement learning algorithm here produces some weights. And now the reinforcement learning algorithm for quote new data, right? so with new features is going to be warm started with the weights from, uh, from the reinforcement learning algorithm here in old data. All right, so, and uh, here's, uh, here's an uh, evaluation, right? So if you, uh, so the kind of the, uh, let's say a benchmark or an upper bound would simply be, let me train, let me perform reinforcement learning or neural architecture search here based on uh, from scratch and here, right? So at the bottom from scratch as well. So this is, this is definitely, you cannot do better than this, right? So in terms of say, in terms of accuracy or F1, whatever is your measure, right? So you cannot do better, but clearly this can be computationally expensive because you're gonna do neural architecture search on new data quote from scratch. All right, so, and this is this top, uh, the blue figure here, right? So it achieves good performance, all right? So, um, um, uh, but when it comes to time, 
right? So you see here that it takes 50 steps sort of to get the same quality solution as, uh, as you get with the less than 20 steps if you reuse the weights, right? So green is reusing weights and uh, blue is uh, start from scratch when you get new, uh, when you get new features. Right, so and part is uh, just uh, partial. So part, oops. so part is essentially suppose you are training your model based on uh, only old uh, features, right? So even new data, even when you have additional features, you simply disregard, them, right? So the orange one clearly uh, clearly underperforms the other two. All right, so now let me talk about uh, about our uh, Delo system. Uh, which is, as I said earlier, sort of a model serving uh, architecture. And, and here I'm going to go a little bit into, into IT aspects, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that bad. Okay? So they're all related, heavily related to machine learning, right? So you probably know that, that all the uh, sort of rage now, or not just now in the last few years is Kubernetes, right? So uh, Docker containers and Kubernetes. Right, so our uh, system is all based on Kubernetes and uh, containers and pods. All right, so we have the model retraining and drift detection uh, modules currently that have already been integrated, so they communicate uh, with each other inside uh, inside a pod. Right, so that's uh, so that's what this this is kind of an architectural uh, design. Right, so, and, uh, and a different perspective is uh, sort of, we have two, the pod has two containers, right? I mean, you can actually have more containers if you run replicas, uh, uh, but essentially one uh, container is in charge of model retraining and the other one of drift detection inside the same pod. And then there is an API that, uh, that synchronizes uh, both of them, right? So in other words, when drift says yeah, you need, uh, we need to retrain the model, then the, uh, then the controller uh, in the master sort of then, uh, quote, wakes up the model retraining pod and retrains the actual, uh, the actual model. All right, so this is the architectural uh, design. All right, so now how can we, we spend a little bit, well, we spend actually quite some amount of time uh, thinking about how do we make this uh, robust, all right? So in a sense, uh, if, uh, if one company is using PyTorch, another one TensorFlow, another one uh, Scikit-Learn, et cetera, or not, I shouldn't say company, but data scientists, all right? So how, how can our system accommodate all of them, all right? So because we don't want to write, so the re retraining code, right? So retraining code heavily relies on the underlying architecture, right? Architecture, uh, network architecture, right? So, so uh, deep neural network uh, architecture. Right, so and and PyTorch representation of that architecture is very different from TensorFlow's representation, right? So, but there is a um, there is a way out, right? So, and that's the so-called Onyx. So, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about Onyx, all right? So, but Onyx is uh, it's not just a framework; it's a solution, all right? So, where you can convert many of the standard uh, uh, many models created by standard tools into one uh, unified uh, binary format, and then you can use that binary format uh, in uh, for for conducting efficient inference. All right. So we together again, so sort of we huddled with member companies, and we jointly uh, got to the conclusion that Onyx is, is a good way to. Uh, uh, to make our system robust, right? So if, uh, in other words, sort of if in training, uh, you've been using scikit-learn, well, you use a, a converter to Onyx, you produce an Onyx file, and then you can use our system. If you use TensorFlow, uh, you use Onyx converter, and you can use our, uh, you can use our system, right? So uh, now what was challenging actually from, uh, for us at least, was how do we take the Onyx format? And so for retraining purposes, for, for retraining code, okay, because our retraining algorithm sort of requires, uh, requires knowing the actual underlying uh, network architecture, right? So, and we want to make this robust, right? So we, want, we don't want to rely that, uh, that this is a CNN, that our code will work only on CNNs, all right? So, or RNNs for that matter, right? So, uh, 
we actually spent quite a lot of time, and this was uh, it's, it's sort of uh, heavy duty software uh, development, right? So on uh, extracting the computational graph from uh, from the Onyx binary format, right? So and then based on that computational graph, then uh, applying our algorithm or applying our more retraining algorithm on top of that computational graph, right? So the bottom line is that now we we have. Uh, with quite a lot of effort, sort of, we have a very, very robust uh, solution on the table. All right, so uh, let me finish this presentation with uh, with feature store. All right, so what exactly is a feature store? Right, so I, I have already said that uh, that this is kind of a, a very important uh, aspect uh, of machine learning, and and that uh, there are quite a few startups now that are offering. Uh, feature store solutions and feature store are not yet part of our uh, of the Dilo system, but it will be integrated into it very soon. Okay. So let me introduce you with the concept of ML uh, of uh, feature stores. So why they are needed, right? So why, why does one need a feature store? So first of all, you can infer from the name what it is, right? So uh, it's a quote, say storage or database. Database is not the right term, actually storage, right? So it's storage of feature vectors. Right, so why do you need a storage of feature vectors? Well, so what happens if you don't have one is you have this several data scientists, right? So data science teams, right? So that are solving different uh, models or producing different models. And each one of them creates, uh, or goes through the process of feature engineering and creates uh, his or her own, uh, let's just say their, okay? It creates their own uh, features. Right, so in essence, each one of them think about it has each team has uh, its own um, feature store. All right, so but the caveat here is, or what is to observe is that that perhaps many of them, uh, many of those features actually are the same features. All right, so and and each one of the three teams, for example, have been writing pretty much the same code that creates that particular feature, right? So it would be nice if that work can be, um, uh, can be, uh, uh, sing well, not synchronized, okay? So can be actually, uh, th that all the redundant work can be taken out of the process, right? So there would be just one single uh, piece of code that's gonna create that feature and then whoever feature vector, right? So, and then uh, it's actually feature, sorry, create that, that uh, given feature and then that given feature can be accessed easily, readily accessed by any uh, by any by any data scientist. Right. So and this is so. The left is sort of the uh, let's say uh, old-fashioned work uh, world with no feature store, and the right is suppose you have feature store, and now your data scientists can access uh, features directly from the feature store, eliminating replicated uh, replicated work. All right, so here's a concrete example. All right, so we, I mean, it's not made up example, okay, but it, I mean, so it's a concrete example. Right? So uh, let's say that uh, you have two, two teams that are predicting, uh, are building models for churn predictions and the other one for customer lifetime value. All right, so the churn prediction model uh, slash team, all right, so is using a feature for uh, the number of purchases in the past year and average spend uh, per month of every single customer, all right? And then they have other features, for example, the total number of call center interactions, right? So customer lifetime value, likewise, <clears throat> it makes sense to have a feature pertaining to the number of purchases in, uh, in the last year, right? So, and the average spend per month, right? So the point is that these two features they are identical features in both models, all right? So, but customer lifetime value, you also want to have a feature, say number of open credit cards, which is probably a feature that you don't want to have in, in a churn model, right? So there are features that, that pertain to, uh, to each individual model, but you also have features that uh, are used by both models, all right? So now, so without a feature store, uh, the the effort here will be the effort to create those two features will be or would be replicated, right? So with the feature store, sort of one team uh, uh, 
write the code for engineering those features and then creates those features from samples and it stores them in, in the feature store. And then the other team then simply fetches those, uh, those features from the feature store. All right, so and then there is, so, so the, this is the so-called offline setting of, uh, of the feature store, which pertains to training. Right, so, but then in, in model serving, then you also use the online version of the feature store, which has the most recent values of the features. Right, so uh, if we uh, focus here on number of purchases in the past year, right, so whenever a purchase is being made, then the online portion of the feature store automatically updates the feature value uh, uh, of that particular uh, feature. Right? So this means that when you do inference, which is depicted here at the bottom, right? so you always get the online version uh, uh, of the feature store always gives you the most recent uh, value of the feature store. All right, so this is also part of, uh, or it's becoming more and more part, integral part of MLOps and, uh, and uh, model serving uh, solutions out there. All right, so I don't plan to spend more uh, on uh, on feature store. So I, I have I have a lot of experience with one particular feature store uh, solution. Okay, so so uh, CDL, all right? So Center for Deep Learning, right? So I spend a lot of time talking about uh, about model serving and, and uh, ML ops, and uh, and how we work with uh, member companies. Right, so we have a similar, uh, not similar. Well, we have a parallel effort. Uh, which is uh, an IoT framework uh, uh, or AI, AI best, uh, AI uh, based IoT framework, right? So um, where we use a lot of open source components, but the unique aspect that we came up with uh, was that in our solution, you can use uh, or you, uh, use, you develop your features in uh, Pandas, right? So in Python Pandas, and then those features then are automatically uh, propagated uh, into your training model as well as your inference model, which in this case is actually done with Flink. All right, so this here it's uh, Flink. All right, so th this is a unique aspect, right? So you you write your feature engineering code just once, and then it gets pushed automatically in inference as well as in training. So you don't need to replicate the work. All right, so um, so I presented to you today. Uh, some of the aspects of MLOps and uh, uh, um, and uh, model serving, all right? So and I focused more on machine learning AI aspects. I didn't go into um, into software aspects such as uh, CI/CD model versioning, etc. Right? So, but I do have experience uh, in that area as well. Uh, but uh, I, I think you're less interested in that aspect. Okay? But let me finish with the following chart here, which is borrowed. Uh, from uh, from the paper that I strongly recommend all of you to read. Uh, its title is Hidden Technical Debt, Debt in ML Systems, right? So, and it's uh, written by Scully and uh, I think there, I mean, not I think, there are many other authors, okay, so from uh, from Google. And, uh, and what is important here is that the actual ML code, training ML code is only a very tiny portion of the overall machine learning uh, pipeline, all right? So this, this all here is, is essentially MLOps, all right? So, and what you're used to and perhaps sort of more comfortable with is the training portion, which is just, just which is this tiny box here, all right? So, so we are often not aware of what else is going on uh, between, uh, between us finishing or being satisfied with a, with a well-performed trained model and that model actually creating business value and, and performing inference in real time, all right? So there's much, much more going on. And our effort, unfortunately, was uh, or is only a small part of the overall picture, all right? So again, I strongly recommend you to read this paper. It's not technical, uh, no Greek. I think there isn't a single Greek letter in the, uh, in the paper. All right, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. I appreciate it. So thanks for being invited. I hope you uh, find it interesting. So I know sort of it's, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it wasn't a typical, they were not typical topics, right? So kind of 
say no supply chains, no marketing in there was a little bit there was a use case in marketing, right? So but uh, it was a little bit kind of on the heavy on the machine learning and uh, and computer science side. Uh, but I, I hope you were able to follow and I didn't overwhelm you with, uh, with new concepts. Um, thank you, Diego, for your excellent presentation. Um, uh, I know we have a few st attendees there. Uh, Beth, can you open the uh, mics for them and if they have any questions? So... Okay, everyone now has the ability to speak. Okay, thank you. And let me just put one of my slides on here. Let's see. Do you want me to stop sharing? No, I'll, I'll take care of it. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, again, I just wanted to... Um, you know, again, for the participants um, uh, on the call, uh, again, this webinar uh, will be recorded and it will be posted on one of the uh, websites, which is listed at the practice session website. You can go under events and it will be posted there. And again, uh, for any of the uh, attendees, if you have any suggestion about any particular speaker or any particular topic or something like that, please send me an email. And also, again, for those who might have come in a little bit later, again, this is what um, the objective of informed section and practices uh, that it conducts three major competitions, um, annual competitions. And we also have some monthly um, events, webinars, and happy hour events. Uh, again, most of those you can find or you should be able to find uh, at the website and register uh, at that particular uh, page. Um, any, I'll just ask see if there's any other, any question from any of the uh, attendees. Okay. Um, if not, I think we will just stop this uh, uh, presentation today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Diego, for your excellent presentation again. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Okay, sure. And, and thank you again, the attendees, for uh, making time to attend this presentation. And we hope you'll join us uh, next time. Uh, we should have the next presentation on April 15th. And of course, next Friday, we will have the virtual network happy hour. And again, you can go to that website and register for that event. And that will also tell you what the topic uh, for that particular presentation is, for that happy hour event is. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Beth. I think we are finished today. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.